County Board Workshop, December 17, 2019, Residence First Facilities. Workshop to order. I'll call this workshop to order. I know we're missing a few folks, but we got we go around and introduce. So if this is your first workshop, we're going to be coming to you. That'll take a while, and I suspect by the time we get through this room, everybody will be here. So to kick off this, uh, this workshop here on uh, our Residence First Facility, I'm going to start with Nicole, and we'll go around and introduce at the table, and then we'll come over here to the wall and go up to the room. So, Nicole, you want to start us off, please? Commissioner Nicole Previn, District 1. Mary Jo McGuire, Commissioner District 2. Joanna Berg, Deputy County Manager. Jean Kruger, Property Management. Jennifer Haskamp, Swanson Haskamp Consulting. Mr. Madison Seale, Commissioner District 3. Jim McDonough, Commissioner District 6. Victoria Reinhardt, Commissioner District 7. Rafael Ortega, District 5. Karen Francois, Deputy County Manager for Information and Public Records. Elizabeth Tolson, Policy and Planning. Policy and Planning. Bridget Stevens, Planner for Safety and Justice Services. Zachary Oak, Policy and Planning. Amy Schmidt, County Attorney's Office. And then Colbert, Task Force Management. Tina Denny, Commissioner Brandon's Office. Melissa Jamrock, Commissioner McGuire's Office. Judy Adama, Policy and Planning. Commissioner uh, Carter's office. Even us, Mr. Madison Steele's office. Rich Christensen, CIO. The America's CFO. Molly, Kelly Wallace, Kelly. Kelly Anderson, FAS. Bridget Wilmer, FAS. Gary Rochek, Property Management. Mark Thompson, Finance. Keith Lattimore, Social Services. Janet. Janet Guthrie, County Manager's office. Amali Guada, Property Management. Scott Tartier, RSP. Alyssa Yoner, Swanson Task Captain's Mike Liner, RSP Ice Books. Karen Saltus, Health and Wellness Admin. Tina Curry, Financial Assistance Services. Dick Trudeau, Health and Wellness Admin. Alicia Hallman, Public Health. Kathy Duffy, Public Health. Diane Holbrook, Public Health. Uh, Christina Ralston, Project Management Office. Karen Che, IPR Admin. Tracy Nelson, ROIG Group. Irene McKay, ROIG Group. Mark Yonda, ROIG Group. Kathy Keane, Public Health. Uh, Max Holbrook, Public Health. Ryan Reese, Parks and Recreation. Mark McKay, Parks and Recreation. Lynn Lyman, Library. Jill Goldenau, Library. Tony? Tony Carter, Ramsey County District 4 Commission. Thanks. And I'm going to steal Trista's line here for my introduction. This is exciting. We've been waiting for this a long time. So I got to take it. <laughs> As you all know, we have a lot of material to get through. So I'm just going to be very brief here this afternoon. When we presented to you in February, Jane and I were here, we were updating you on a year's worth of work in uh, accessible service delivery and facilities. Today we are here with the last several months of work in the Residence First Facilities Group. Since our February board workshop, we have um, moved this work <coughs> under the Residence First uh, umbrella, which is co-led by uh, Deputy County Manager Karen Fran Francois, Paul Allwood, who has a, um, an unavoidable commitment this afternoon, and myself. So I just want to provide that overall construct. This is one of three pillars of residence. Um, first, the others are technology and people and processes. With that, uh, I will turn it over to Gene and we'll get started. And Gene, before you jump in, I'm going to ask the commissioners. Um, I think this presentation is going to be best delivered with consistency throughout. So write down slide numbers, write down your questions, so that when we get to the end, you can reference the slide, we can get up to all your questions and have the conversation. Gene. Thank you, Chair McDonough, Commissioners. Before we begin today, I do want to take a little uh, additional time to talk about really the, the team that has led this work in 2019. In addition to myself, property management, our project manager, Amato Guevara, and then we have done this work in conjunction with the outside resources, that those being Jennifer Haskamp, uh, sitting here at the table with me from Swanson Haskamp Consulting, as well as Scott Pelletier and Ellison Yonner. Um, they were really the design team that, that led this initiative, and certainly we couldn't uh, have gotten all of this done without their help. I'm going to kick off with a couple slides here, and then I will be uh, turning it over to Jennifer to talk about the work that they, that they led on our behalf. The goals really for the workshop today are to certainly share with you, update you on the work that we have done this year, 
and to talk about really some of the process and of course the key findings uh, from that work. And again, that's primarily what Jennifer will, will present to you in a couple minutes. Then I will speak a lot about how we're going to bring that all together within the county and seek for your concurrence on the next steps that we identify. As Joanna mentioned, the Residence First facilities is one part of the bigger, I'm going to say massive, uh, Residence First priority of the county. We have the objective within this particular component to really improve the resident experience when they're accessing county services at facilities. And we know that they also access services without going to facilities, but again, our focus is the, those that are delivered at our facilities. Really, we wanted to develop concepts that explored and concluded with what is the right mix of services to have in the locations and what are those right locations but for today we're speaking a bit more around the general locations we want to seek that concurrence around the concept that we're presenting today and we've started to look at some of the high level uh, numbers in terms of people and square footages but obviously there will be more work to do there as we move forward with the concept just agenda uh, quickly again the process and the, uh, we went through on the project engagement Jennifer will talk a lot about the the second bullet here which really gets at to the what services who who do we serve what are those resident characteristics how do they access our services or maybe how should they could they how would they rather access our services and then where what is that service delivery concept all of that being uh, tied up in the key findings that we'll share. We also spent a considerable amount of time really talking about discussing what are those core services and what are the amenities that should go along at any location. And then we have, uh, then we moved into developing different concepts and we will share that and discuss next steps. As we began the project and we talked about, so what is in? What is it we're really talking about here? And it is the public facing services and programs and really those that would be best to be integrated and located for the benefit of the residents. So this isn't about absolutely everything that the county does, but it, are, it is about those programs and services that would be beneficial to integrate. Although our work is about facilities component of this, we had to assume a couple things as we went into this. And those assumptions include the fact that a change in our culture as a county and how we deliver services is necessary. I mean, that in essence was a given. It's how we went into this initiative. And that it is all about residents first. We have to be conscious of and consider staff and their location as well but it, this element is about residents first. We also had to assume that technology and processes not only had to be integrated, but that they would be, and that is parallel work that goes on under the bigger residents first umbrella. And also that this is really a cross-functional approach to lead to modernized service delivery. Just to go back a little bit in time, uh, maybe more than a little bit in time, uh, <laughs> touch on some of the prior work. Uh, this goes back before I was in property management. In 2014 is when the county strategic facilities plan was originally put together. Some additional work was done uh, in 2015. Some of you may remember uh, that work being shared by World Architects. But then as Joanna mentioned, it was really in 2018 under the Accessible Service Delivery and Facilities Initiative that we did a deeper dive with staff, really engaged staff in what and how we need to move forward. And also we did, if you'll recall, a good amount of resident surveys and intercept surveys and really asking people at our facilities uh, where services are delivered key questions about what they would like to see as we move forward. Joanna mentioned the board workshop in February 2019 where we shared the uh, outcomes of the accessible service and delivery, accessible service delivery and facilities work. And then in April of 2019, we had one of the countywide leadership group meetings, which is where uh, 
County Manager O'Connor brings together really the top 250 or so leaders, managers in the, in the county, shares many things, and in April of 2019, <laughs> it was really around this Residence First Facilities Initiative, so that we were able to really make more of the staff aware of this work and of the work that was coming and enlist their help in uh, many ways, as you'll see when we move a little bit further here. Now I would like to uh, turn it over to Jennifer Haskamp, who will really talk about the work that she and her uh, peer, Ellison Yonner, and Scott Piltier, and RSP, completed for us. So first of all, it's really nice to meet all of you and be in front of you. I was actually in attendance in February as well. Um, so I got to at least experience how you all work in a <laughs> workshop environment. So hopefully uh, this is as exciting as you're hoping that it will be. Um, <laughs> so um, actually our work on this project really started uh, with the countywide leadership group meeting. Uh, if, for those of you who uh, were briefed on it, we actually held two breakout sessions during that uh, kind of my leadership group meeting uh, where we actually started to talk about service delivery concepts and get some feedback from some of the leadership that was in that meeting. Um, and during that meeting, that's really when we started to hone in on what this process would look like and how we would structure it um, and what would be important to really include. Um, and so out of that came the development or the creation of the advisory working group. Um, and the advisory working group has been working essentially for the last eight months um, on this process and this project, uh, taking some of those preliminary things that we heard in the countywide leadership group meeting and betting them and trying to get a better understanding of service delivery services um, and, et cetera, and where and how those would be delivered from a location perspective. So my portion of the presentation really focuses on the work of that advisory working group um, so you'll see on this diagram up here, we're going to talk a little bit about research and discovery, but we're really going to focus in on project engagement um, and talk a little bit about the service mix and the, the scenarios that developed out of that advisory working group. Um, once I get through that, I'm going to pass it back over to Jean, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about the recommendations and sort of the bringing it all together piece as it's identified in your presentation. Um, so we would be remiss if we didn't point out the advisory working group. Uh, these are the folks that participated with us over the last eight months. Um, I see many of them in the room today, so I obviously appreciate their support in being here because uh, they put a lot of work into this and they met with us for a lot of hours and questioned many times why we were doing what we were doing. Um, and hopefully it made sense in the end, but as we were going through it, there was a lot of questions about why are we doing it this way? So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through uh, the, the presentation. So in addition to the advisory working group, we also uh, reached out to key stakeholders and then also did some supplemental interviews. Uh, the stakeholders that we identified were those folks that we felt like could offer something um, in terms of clarification or information with respect to how they're helping deliver county services or how they partner with us. Um, so from that perspective, there are a few different third-party partners that really come up all the time. And when you look at the, the website, the county's website, for example, uh, there's a lot of uh, arrows pointing at some of these organizations. And as a result, we thought, let's go talk to them and find out how they're delivering the services. So uh, we talked to Catholic Charities, got a tour of the Opportunity Center, which is a fabulous new uh, site and facility, and we learned a lot about how they're delivering those services there or intend to deliver the services there. Uh, we talked with Goodwill Easter Seals, uh, and then we convened an affordable housing roundtable. And actually, I would say that was a very interesting um, process because we essentially identified folks that we know either are interested in doing affordable housing development in Ramsey County or those that already have facilities. So we actually had the development side and the operator side in the room with us and said to them, how do you know what services the people who live in your communities need? How do you direct them to county services? Um, how do they talk to, uh, how do your, your uh, facility folks talk to residents and connect them with those services? Um, and we learned an enormous amount about that. So uh, you'll see in a couple of slides, I, I put in a graphic that I think talks about where those affordable housing 
uh, projects or houses are, um, and it gives us some insight into where there might be service needs. In addition to the advisory working group, uh, as we went through that process, it became very clear that a couple of your departments are very complex, and how they deliver services and what services they provide um, is really challenging to try to understand. Uh, so we felt it was very important to actually go and interview those departments to supplement the information that we were collecting. Um, so you'll see on the right hand side here that we went and spoke with community corrections. Uh, we, I believe there were 18 or 20 individuals that were in that meeting. It was a great turnout and they provided mm -hmm. great information. Uh, we talked with financial assistance, we spoke with public health and social services as well. Those three last departments were actually represented on the advisory working group. Um, so we, we were able to actually take some of the feedback we heard in the advisory working group and then go and talk with some of the, the folks that are actually providing the services and say, okay, we need to understand this a little bit better. How to, what services go together, what co-locations co are important, et cetera, and kind of supplement that information. So here's uh, what we've been calling sort of the stepping stones, if you will, the steps that we went through the process. This is, this is the part that I think the advisory working group kind of questioned, what are we doing and, and how are we going to get to a place where we have scenarios at the end of this? Um, but we really started on the very lowest level, which is the, the what. And when we say what in this case, we were actually talking about the services. So this was a little bit different angle to take with respect to the project because instead of saying, let's talk about departments, we said, let's try to actually get a list of public facing services from some of these uh, key groups like social services and public health, et cetera, and say, let's talk about the services and who are you serving the most and who's the most in need. And let's get a real list together to try to understand what then services should be located in what facilities and locations. Um, so that's where we started. The second piece was who. So once we figured out what the comprehensive list of services, we had to take a look at, well, who's actually accessing the services? If we don't understand who's accessing them, then we can't, figure, we can't figure out what location they might best be served, right? Um, so the who actually became probably the most challenging, if I, if I had to guess, um, for the advisory working group to really get, get, our, get our pulse on who is the who in this equation. Um, then we stepped up to how. How is, are they taking transit? Are they driving their cars? Are they parking at the facility? Are they, are there accessible locations? Are there inaccessible locations? Are there perceptions of inaccessibility, et cetera? So how really focused on truly how do they get to the facility? How, it, what location are they going to? Uh, the next step was the where. So where should you locate the services, right? So once we have those building blocks established, then that leads us to the where. From that, we ended up with a couple of draft scenarios, which I know are in your appendix today. So um, we actually, I think, ended up with three different concepts that we took a look at. Um, so in addition to those concepts, there were also underlying key themes and takeaways uh, that regardless of what location or scenario you, you end up going with, really need to be at the heart of understanding how to locate service and what facilities should be located where and what things should you pay attention to. So we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So just one, one addition real quickly on that slide at the bottom, the, the first building block, I just want to call it out because it remains an ongoing internal conversation, it's a big deal, so I want to make sure I reflect it here, which is the not clinical services piece to that component. Mm -hmm. Clinical services, we need a long-term answer to it. I am not in any way suggesting through this process that we don't. It is different than much of what else we do, and we do it differently than other counties often do it as well. And that conversation with public health and health and wellness has been ongoing about how do we think about the future of clinical services, but we're just segmenting it out from the what here. We don't, we don't necessarily see this core to this project for a host of different reasons. I just wanted to talk about that briefly all up. Just give a couple of examples of clinical service so we can understand. Sure. What so it's the 555 building would be the shortest, easiest way to say it, but tuberculosis, <laughs> detox services also fit, sexual health services. There's opportunities with community-based clinics and others to think about ways to embed differently that we think might be more appropriate than this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And one piece actually adding on to that just a little bit, when we were going through this process and putting together the list of services, uh, when we were with the advisory working group, we told departments, hey, 
don't limit yourself. Think about all the services and then we'll figure out which ones to take out. So um, some of those actually infiltrated and made their way into the master list and we had to go back and kind of strip them out so that we were really talking about the list of services that would be applicable to this process. All right, so that's a great segue into this uh, slide, which is really talking about what services uh, did we come up with and how many were there. And I think there was a little bit of shock on the part of the advisory working group and perhaps on your part also um, with respect to how many we're really talking about. And when we looked at this, we really tried to narrow it down to public facing services. So those services where there's a public facing um, component or interaction that occurs. Um, and we came up with conservatively 194. Um, to tell you the truth, we think that that number is actually low. There's actually, I believe, a few more because um, people forget because there's 194, right? Um, so from that perspective, I actually think that it's higher than 194, but that's still a very big number when you're talking about what you're actually providing to residents. Um, so when you correlate that number of those public-facing services to the staff that is considered with respect to that, it's just about 2,000 staff members. Um, so and those, those numbers are actually based on the information that was obtained in 2014 and 2015 primarily in the world study. Um, so it's likely that that number is actually a little bit higher as well, but this gives you a really good benchmark of, of what we're dealing with in terms of the number of programs that we considered and looked at uh, and how many staff correlate to that. Um, for it, just to illustrate the spectrum of the departments that we're talking about, this graphic really talks about how many, how many programs and services are associated with each of these uh, departments. Uh, for example, public health has 42. You'll note when we get a little bit further along that several of the programs and services that have a public facing component to public health actually didn't make their way into the core services that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. That's very purposeful. It's because some of the sites, like for example, uh, waste, the waste collection or the recycling or the, those types of things, we're not suggesting those get moved into core services, right? So when we take a look at those things, that's part of why their number looks very high and it might feel as though they're slightly underrepresented in the core services. But we'll talk about that in a few moments as well, but just to give you a little foreshadowing. So then we went to the second meeting. The second meeting was about who, and as I said to you, I think this was probably the most challenging with respect to our advisory working group process. Um, part of that, I think, is because there's uh, this desire on the part of all the departments, at least from what I witnessed, to serve everyone, right? And to make sure that everyone throughout the whole county gets access to services that need it. Um, and so this become, became a very challenging conversation because uh, there was a lot of discussion about how do we reach all corners of the county, how do we serve everybody, um, as opposed to trying to figure out who needs it the most, or who are we serving the most, and where is the greatest opportunity? So when we look at those things, this became a really challenging topic. Um, however, we were able to come up with and identify some overlapping resident characteristics um, for those who, what we called, we just kept saying it, most and most need. Um, so most in terms of sheer quantity of folks that we're serving, and most need of who needs it the most. How do we make sure uh, that we understand who those those folks are and those characteristics. So that's what this list identifies. Many of these are characteristics that we can either map through census data, which is very powerful and helpful. Um, and also a lot of this has, uh, it, it's tracked through the departments. So the departments also have data with respect to um, identifying geographically where these folks are. Um, so when we put all that information together, we're then able to look at patterns and, uh, and identify pockets or areas of the county that might need services the most. It's not saying they do, it's saying there's the opportunity, right? Um, also, when we overlap folks or residents that are actually accessing the services, these maps really do have a strong correlation and there's a strong pattern that emerges. So, um, one of the things we heard over and over again through this process was, we serve families, right? So not individuals, we serve families. And it's not that we don't serve individuals, but this, this focus on the family, um, the households with children, um, that, that, that's a dominant characteristic that, that the departments are seeing in terms of who they serve. Um, so to help us understand that, we put this, this map together based on 
uh, the census data from 2017 of estimates of where are the households with families. So it's just one characteristic that when we overlay it with some of the others, uh, patterns start to emerge in terms of geographies or, or geographic areas that, that you may consider locating a facility. Our third meeting was focused on the how. Um, so obviously everybody's mind usually goes straight to, did they take a car, Do they, did they take the bus, did they hop on the light rail? Um, but obviously we also have to consider things like, did they walk here, um, did they bike here? Are, thing, are there ADA accessible ramps that are available to get into all of the entrances and, th and things like that? So access means a lot of different things. It also can relate to language. Um, it can relate to branding and messaging and making sure that when somebody comes into a facility, they can actually know where they're supposed to go in terms of wayfinding, et cetera. So how can mean a whole lot of different things to a lot of different people? This particular process really focused on from how, from a geographic and location perspective. So it did, didn't discount any of those other things. It notes them, but we're not here to make recommendations about wayfinding in your buildings, right? But if we heard something specific, it will make its way into the final report. The main focus here is really about the, the location of the geographic access. The other piece of how, which I know is part of your three step stool or prongs or however you're referring to them, is the technology piece is really changing access and facilities, right? So from that perspective, we did have to consider and look at from a service perspective, does all of the service provision happen in person? Do portions of it happen you know, electronically, via web? How does that relationship look? And then what's it going to mean in terms of facilities and location? I don't know that we have the answer for that <laughs> today, uh, but it's certainly something that was considered and we talked about um, pretty much at every advisory working group meeting. So the fourth meeting, we really talked about the where. So when we take a look at and start identifying these different patterns, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of, of uh, geographic characteristics of where folks are living, when we take a look at who's accessing the services and we overlay that with the transit lines and look at all of this, we get to sort of identify patterns geographically in areas of the county where there might be the need for a location or a facility or just a service doesn't even necessarily, it could be a kiosk, it could be a whatever it is, but we start to look at it and be able uh, to say there might be an opportunity here. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces that we pulled in, and I'm going to use the affordable housing roundtable that we talked about, uh, is we actually pulled all of the contractually obligated affordable housing units in Ramsey County because we know that contractually they're going to have to provide affordable housing for whatever their contract period is. Um, so when you look at the map on the right hand side, you're able to see that we've got certain areas where there's higher concentrations of units, right? So we've got the I-35 corridor, which you see a pretty heavy concentration. You've got a pocket or concentration on the east side of St. Paul. Um, and then, of course, you've got it surrounding the I-94 corridor and also in the downtown. So um, when you start to look at the unit counts, you really start to understand um, where some of these contractually obligated units are. Now, this doesn't suggest where there may be opportunities for new units. However, I know you're all familiar with that challenge um, when it comes to how do you rank and get a project and all of those things. Um, and when we talked to the, uh, the affordable housing folks at the round table, they talked about how transit is one of the key attributes of being able to get a project financed um, and developed. And so when you overlap this with the transit lines and the known trans or transit planned improvements, you can start to see where there may be opportunities <coughs> that become available. Um, and I would offer and suggest that where there's existing units, there's likely to be more if you can make it happen. So finally, actually, as part of meeting number four and part of meeting number five, we actually uh, came up with a couple of scenarios, which are those that you found um, in the appendix. And part of that meeting number four and meeting number five was really centered around what are some of the key findings, what are some of the, the high risers or the topics that come out of that to help inform um, where a location recommendation should be. And so. I'm not necessarily going to read through all of these, but I'm going to highlight a few of them. So 
Um, the first one is that there's a lot of overlap in the resident services and characteristics and locations. So what we mean by that is when you talk to different departments, they are serving a lot of the same people or folks that have the same characteristics. So you can start to look at the maps and really start to get a sense of, from a location perspective, what might be target areas that you want to make sure that you're serving. Another piece that came out of this, which to be honest with you was a little bit surprising to me, is that transit, while it's important, uh, a lot of folks continue to drive and that that's likely to continue. And for the, for the reason that we were focused on families, people with children or you know, households with children, it's, it's very hard to hop on a bus to stand on a corner, to hop on a bus and get to the service, or hop on the transit or the LRT, right? Um, and so there is a lot of feedback that we heard that yes, transit is important, and this needs to be something that we consider, but equally as important is the availability of parking, uh, easy parking, free parking, uh, easy access in and out of the facility, et cetera. So transit, while it was important, it was actually almost at the same level, if not a little bit less, than driving, which I thought was an interesting in terms of the feedback. Uh, we heard a lot about downtown, and I know that that is one of those pieces that's a little bit of a challenge because downtown St. Paul is, it's the cat St. Paul is the capital, it is, um, it's an important area. I'm also a Ramsey County resident, so it's, it's sort of an important part of, of what makes the county the county, right? Um, but we did hear over and over again that there's a challenge, but there's multiple locations um, and so because you're in a downtown environment, it's not like a suburban area with um, a huge sign out front and you know every single service that's in that building. So there's that challenge of I come downtown, do I know what services are actually in that building or am I going to be sent to another facility or another building, right? So there's that challenge of it. The second piece of that really did come down to the ability to easily find parking, get in and out, um, and the ability to pay for it. So when you put all those pieces together, um, there's a lot of conversation about downtown. Um, and whether that's positive or negative, but it's certainly something to consider as you move forward. Um, data privacy was brought up repeatedly through this process. Um, and data privacy from the perspective of departments being able to collaborate with each other. So that when a res if you look at bullet number one, we've got overlapping resident characteristics so that if a resident comes in, they're filling out an intake form once, not 10 times. And that that's able to be shared with others and that has a direct impact on location, right? Because if they have to go to facility A, B, C, and D and give the exact same information, how could we make that interaction easier? And maybe they go to one location instead of five. Um, so I'm gonna flip to the, to the the right hand set of, of bullets um, from the standpoint of staff also communicated throughout this whole process and interest in providing services that are closer to the resident locations. Um, so that really had to do with uh, folks that are internal to your departments that are actually going out to different areas and making sure that they have the ability to get there easily, that there's easy parking. Um, and also whether or not you'd actually have a physical location in those areas which might make it easier for some of the residents to actually come in as opposed to them always having to go out. The last bullet that I'm going to touch on is mobile staff because th there's been a lot of conversation about what that means. And the one thing that I took away from this process is there's a desire to be more mobile, which ties directly into the statement about meeting residents where they are. But there was a direct statement throughout the whole process of but we're always going to need a home base. Staff needs to come back. There's an element of collaboration amongst your staff that's very important for them to be able to talk with each other and collaborate on particular um, issues and, and topics or, or even case files or, you know, from a case management perspective. So all of this leads to the, the, the big statement, which I feel like is actually a little bit small, but is a big statement on this, is strategic co-locating can benefit residents, right? So I would say that's one of the main takeaways out of, if you look at all of these pieces collectively, that statement is really sort of the overarching principle. 
So when we say that, when we say strategic co-locating, what do we mean? We're actually talking about how do we take strategic co-locations um, to benefit residents, right? So how do we get a, a group of core services co-located in geographic areas that best serve the residents? Um, so when we say core services, I know that that term probably gets thrown out there quite a bit, but in, for purposes of this project, when we say core services, they are a mix of cross-department public-facing services. So we're talking about taking strategic services from those key departments that were on the advisory working group primarily um, and putting them in, in a, a one location or multiple locations, whatever you end up going with. But that's when we say core, it's that group of services. The goal is that those services are convenient, they're consistent, and they're adaptable. And when we say adaptable, we're talking about the fact that we know that financing changes. You know, the Fed might might fund a certain service today, and two years from now, it doesn't exist anymore. So you have to be able to adapt some of those services to make sure you've got the right mix together. Um, but you want to be consistent. So when we say core services, if the core services are in a particular location, they are there. It's not optional. It's just part of that recipe, if you will, of that facility. Again, we focused, the, the services were, fo the so I should say, the services that were selected or identified in, the, in this first go around of core services are those that are catered to the most in need or the most. So that's based on the feedback we got through the advisory working group um, and through some of the stakeholder engagement, et cetera, but who, what services are matched with those two categories? And that's how we identify the core services. Um, the, the core services are benefited by co-locating with each other, right? So there's the element of I'm in a location because this matches where the residents are, but then there's also the benefit of we can talk to each other. If we're in the same, if we're in different departments, we could actually talk with each other about the same case file, for example. Um, and as I said, it, it is either at one facility or it might be at multiple facilities, depending on what scenario you're looking at. But it's basically taking that core service group of services and possibly putting them at multiple locations. What core services are not? They are not indicative indicative of importance. There are many, many services that are not identified in your core services that we've presented today that are very important and are critical to the residents. So it's, it's not saying that these are the top services, the most important, it's not that. It's, not, it's just saying which ones can benefit the most by being together. It's not comprehensive of all service offerings. I think that might go without saying a little bit and with respect to, um, you know, you've got certain services that don't necessarily benefit by being next to others. They, they operate very well by themselves. So from that perspective, they may not have been included. Um, and, which Ryan touched on a little bit, it's not the specialty facilities. So we know that those are important too. They're an important part of this. Um, but like some of the clinical spaces, uh, the mental health clinic, the, et cetera, et cetera, those weren't included in this. All right. So the core services that we identified, this is the high level summary, and I'm saying high level summary because um, when you look at all the, the 194 services, if you will, they sort of roll up underneath some of the higher levels, and this is that roll up. So this is the highest level. Um, so you'll see we've got, it looks like a list of six or seven core services, but really when you look at the services and programs that this touches on, when we looked at it, it's about 50 programs and services that actually get encapsulated into this core services. Um, so 25%, right? Fif about 50 out of 194. Then when we go to the next tier, which are the core services, uh, services, other services, not in the core services, that could be beneficial if they were co-located next to the core services. So that's this list. If you were to add up all the services that were in here, you're talking another 50 or so services, plus or minus. So between the core services and the beneficial core services, we're at somewhere around 100 of the 200. Um, so this is just a very high level summary of that uh, because Otherwise, we might be looking at 10 slides. Hmm. 
So in addition to the services that we identified in the core services, there were certain pieces of the facility location. Can I add one thing to that part? Sure. Just because it's, it's going to be a confusing part for everybody, and there's a ton there, and I actually went way down a hole on this, and you could spend all day on what's in, what's not. There's, well, part of what we learned even with Opportunity Center is at some point we're going to have to sort of define parameters for a go forward and building a box. I'll just, you know, we have to have a box into which we decide. This gives us tiered criteria to how we start to assess how much can fit in the box and what it might do. And so at some level what it says is not what's in or what's out, but as we make parameter-based decisions as a, as a collective at this table with the board, it gives us a chance to then turn around and go back and say, so what would that mean in terms of core and coordinated? And I just want to share that I think that's the biggest important takeaway as opposed to the granular service delivery port today. In the future, then we come back and say, that's, this is what it might start to look like. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the services and <coughs> programs that are actually <coughs> or in a facility location, there were certain pieces with respect to the features of the spaces or the physical space um, that were important to consider as well. So if you were gonna create a service center or whatever it might be where you would have these core services, what else do we need to consider in addition to the services and programs? Um, so we talked and touched a little bit on mobile staff. Uh, so in addition to just having touchdown spaces for mo mobile staff at these facilities, you actually would be benefited if you also have small meeting spaces or collaboration spaces where they could actually meet up with each other, be able to talk through a particularly challenging case, et cetera. Um, we talked a lot about flexible tech spaces. Uh, the ability for residents even to be able to maybe come in, use a space, video conference with someone who is from a different service or program that's maybe not in that physical space, um, but still be able to get answers. Um, so one of the things, uh, an example of that is, for example, we were hearing that the assessor or an appraiser may be a conversation someone would want to have, but they wouldn't be a part of the core services. So they may be able to um, video conference in and talk with the appraiser or the assessor and not have to go to the, the, the physical space for that. Um, third parties and contractors became an interesting conversation because nearly all of your departments talked quite a bit about the 30 third party partners that they had in the community um, and that oftentimes those relationships are that we are going to them, right? Well, th this is saying why don't we provide some opportunities where they can come to us, that there might actually be space where we could have um, some flex <coughs> space that they could come to us so we're not always relying on going to them particularly if there are specific geographic areas or pockets of neighborhoods, et cetera, that you're looking to serve. Um, space for safe and private reporting. We give an example of adult and child protection that, that was brought up. Um, small meeting rooms. Uh, that the, the small meeting rooms may be for other county departments' use. So for example, uh, the mental health or probation appointments. There's some discussion about whether or not we put probation space in one of these facilities or not. Um, but there was some discussion of, you know, if we just had a space where the probation officer could actually meet with someone in a private space, that that might accomplish what we needed to accomplish. Um, so having those types of spaces in the facility available. Um, and then large meeting rooms. Those would really be more for educational and training spaces. There's a lot of talk about, well, you know, we don't actually need to be in the core services or be there on a, you know, eight, hour, eight hours a day, five days a week kind of environment, but it would be great if we could actually hold um, our licensing training at that location, for example, or, or whatever it may be. So in addition to sort of those meeting spaces or collaborative spaces, then there was some talk about, you know what, there's some services that maybe don't necessarily um, need full-time attention from someone. So that's where we might actually have drop-off boxes uh, where you could actually drop off a form or a payment that you need to get to another department that you don't need to talk to someone. Next step up would be, all right, we have somebody who's available who could answer some questions but maybe isn't um, a specialist or isn't from a particular department, um, but you sort of have this staffed self-service area where there's some things the resident could do by themselves um, but they could get a little bit of county assistance if they needed it. But this wouldn't be like the direct service provision, this would be more like um, an information person that could help out. Um, 
again, that focus on families came up. So the children's waiting area, making sure that there are spaces where people can come and they can bring their kids and they don't have to worry about, you know, is my child going to knock something over? There's actually designated space for them. Um, and then security and finally ample parking, which again, <coughs> parking, parking came up. Parking, I mean, <laughs> parking. <laughs> so I'll just keep saying that. And parking again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what does all of this tell us? Well, from, from the perspective of the advisory working group, um, there's a lot that has to be considered when we're looking at location recommendations in terms of how do we best serve the residents. And they all have um, a little bit different idea of what that even means um, because they're all delivering services in different ways. Um, so if we were to say what are sort of the guiding pieces that need to inform any location recommendation, that's what, that's what we put here, which is also incredibly difficult to summarize in one sentence, but we did our best. Um, so first of all, with respect to the what, the <coughs> facility location decisions really need to lead with services first. So as opposed to saying this department needs to be here, it really should be flipped and say what services should be where. Right? So who? Many services consider the needs of families and the community, and it, that's beyond the ind individual. So from a who perspective, and when we're looking at how the next piece, people access, keep families in mind. Um, because overwhelmingly, we heard that from nearly everybody that we talked to, that sort of that idea of the family. Um, and it, it, all, it went all the way to the top to even retired folks, like seniors, right? M most communities I go to or places I go to, it's all about seniors and the baby boomer population, et cetera. That came up, but it also came up with then multi-generational households, right? And so even just, you know, uh, veteran services, they talked about, well, yes, I serve the veteran, but then it's their family, right? So keeping that in mind with respect to the who when we're making a location recommendation. Um, how? Again, there's a lot of talk about mobility. There's a lot of talk about tech. Um, but at the end of the day, technology is not going to replace the worker, and it's not going to replace the interaction with the resident. It can supplement. It can enhance. But there's going to be a person interaction that occurs. Um, the where. You want to make sure that you're delivering your services with the right mix of services where it hopefully it's going to be the most beneficial for your residents. Um, so if we can get the right mix of services in the right locations, it's going to improve the resident experience um, and hopefully make it easier for everybody, including staff and residents. Um, and the where, and this is a little bit of a funny one, but at the same token, is very relevant to everything that we heard, which is referrals are a huge part of the, the business if you will. And if there are facilities that can help with you know, good co-locations, with, with departments that are together, um, and they understand and know what services are being delivered from the same place, your, your opportunity to be uh, uh, more efficient and effective and help the residents, I think, goes up exponentially. Um, so if I were to summarize all of our work, those are the five bullets. I was going to say six, but there's not a six bullet. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to pass it back over to, to Jean to talk a little bit about the recommendations. Thank you for that, Jennifer, to you, uh, the rest of the design team and the advisory working group. That it was a, a big effort, a lot of time, and good input from everybody uh, to provide us with these recommendations. As we look to uh, bringing this all together within the county, I want to just again highlight Jennifer's comments around this looking at you know, where, where are or who are the most in numbers of who we serve and who are those, where are those that are most in need. And we tried to keep that in mind as we move forward and look to, to bring it in, into the county. The Residence First Service Delivery model, as we know, has to keep those things in mind, but the overall model also has to account for the rest of the staff, if you will, the non-public facing. And so we had to you know, give that some consideration as well. 
as mentioned earlier in terms of some of those assumptions that we had to make, in order for this to work, we do have to create the policies and practices that are going to allow these strategies to be successful. And we have to align the county's infrastructure and technology investments to make this happen. And I'm not there just talking about the, the brick and mortar investment, but truly uh, leaps forward in technology. Because this is a very big lift, we're looking at a phase 10 year plan, and that's what we'll share in a moment. So as we bring this all together, in terms of the proposed vision for the resident's first facility location, we really looked at where can that integrated delivery of the core services be done in a place that's easily accessible by transit, vehicles, bikes, scooters, pedestrians, drop off. Um, where can it function as that one-stop shop, again, for the most and the most in need? We talked about the vision including neighborhood locations. The neighborhood locations may or may not have as many services as the location, but they'd have a tailored mix of service depending upon the needs within that neighborhood. Those neighborhood locations, certainly we're viewing uh, the need for some in suburban locations, but we're not discounting the fact that there may be a need within St. Paul for neighborhood locations as well. In any event, mobile service teams are what need to be created, put in place to really ensure that we're able to deliver services everywhere, uh, specifically neighborhoods who might be more reluctant to come into a big government building, if you will. And we've talked time and time again here around the technology, the policies to make all this happen. So it is at this point the recommendation for residents first facilities that we take a hard look at the integrated service delivery location being somewhere within St. Paul. On the map, it's really envisioned in the, uh, I'll call it a darker uh, shaded area, orange shaded area, St. Paul. A location within that shaded area would be no more than five miles from the edges of that shaded area. So, I mean, edge to edge, that area is five miles. So somewhere within there is a pretty good proximity to all residents within that area. I, obviously, a location would have to be, a found, be found within that that has that ready access to transit in line with the work the county is doing on the transit lines, the new lines, etc. cetera. Um, their paths in and out of St. Paul and downtown certainly are going to continue to make downtown be a opportune location for those that take transit. For those who do drive, obviously, I hate to say it cliche, but all roads do lead downtown. I mean, it is the one place people can get um, via vehicles if we address available and affordable parking. The neighborhood locations, based again on the work that was done and identifying where are the residents um, who by number or by need are in the category of most. And really the three suburban areas identified here meet those criteria. It's not to say there aren't families or individuals in need outside of those shaded areas, but when we really look at putting our facilities where that most need or most numbers are, it would be within those lighter shaded areas. The lighter shaded areas, end to end if you will, are only three miles across, so we are definitely providing facilities out within the suburban areas as alternatives to being um, in the downtown or the major location. Again, mobile service teams that would operate or be able to go to partner sites or community sites would supplement this, and they would also be able to um, be additional staff to supplement at our locations and would use the, our locations, again, for that collaborative or partnering space with the other the others uh, in, the, in their department and others 
to best serve the needs of the of the uh, of those that they are serving at the locations. I just want to mention here as well that the Opportunity Center opened just uh, six weeks ago really gave us a little bit of a, of a test case and I think that the work that's being done there, some of the data that's being gathered there is really proving out that co-locating services and the right mix of services is very beneficial. I know they're pulling uh, data together um, and we'll have more results but they can show the number of people who do receive or, or benefit from receiving multiple services <coughs> at that one location. Something we really you know, didn't have the data to back up before, but it's proving that co-location is very beneficial. What we have not been able to really take the steps with at Spock are integrated services. We have the multiple services there and it's beneficial, but at this point, we really can't say that's integrated. It's each of the different services and their staff or their team delivering their individual service. So it's a step, but it's not the end all in terms of integrated service delivery. Not yet. I mean, that's, that's the work yet to be done. As we mentioned and beyond, you know, the resident's first facility for the resident facing services and the resident uh, facing service delivery teams, we also have to plan for those that are not in the resident facing world. And the courthouse, Metro Square, and Plato really become the integrated administrative anchors for the county. Metro Square over time we envision becoming fully county occupied which means the non-county tenants that we have uh, would have their leases uh, end at some point in the next few years. And we also see the Plato building at this point serving as a transitional role as we need to move and rearrange. And Plato building <coughs> may in fact remain for the longer term, um, not yet fully determined as we have to look at exactly how much space we need um, in both the resident facing and the non excuse me, in the public facing and the non-public facing roles. As we talked previously for the uh, initial years at least, the clinical and specialty service facilities uh, stay where they are, but they will also be looked at with a residence facing lens and some of the overall improvements look to be incorporated there as well. They just would not be integrated into the new facilities. The definite intent is that the owned East Building would be vacated, the leased North St. Paul facility would be vacated by or before the lease expiration in November of 2021, and we would look through this process at our existing suburban locations and trying to see which of those might afford us the opportunity to establish some of these touchdown spaces or meeting spaces for the mobile staff and or all staff uh, to stop in and use when they might be in those uh, suburban locations. Again, the rest of the story, we, we touch on it every time, but it really does come to these support arenas of technology, policies, procedures, cultures, all to support this new integrated service delivery and the mobile staff. Certainly we believe the benefits of proceeding with this model, um, again, come back to the integrated and adaptable services for residents. And I think here the key is really the adaptability and the flexibility. Again, we don't know what tomorrow looks like and we have to build in that flexibility so that we aren't outdated, so that we can continue to evolve as the needs of the residents or the locations of the residents with needs <coughs> change and that we can more quickly adjust to those factors. This model aligns the facilities with the locations um, that really match the county and the regional's investment in transit and in multimodal access. 
It really is part of the uh, EGCI and the economic development aspects of the county uh, and the region and to tie our investment in areas with that of our uh, the economic growth for the county is really a key to, to this initiative as well. The model again creates the mobile teams, get the resources closer to people, also addresses some of the concerns we've uh, heard and uh, know occur in some of the communities that do have a distrust uh, in, in government in general and certainly in going to buildings where perhaps there happens to be law enforcement standing there. And so those mobile teams will be vital to getting services out closer in those communities and in the neighborhoods in less uh, institutional buildings. This really all moves us forward, positioning Ramsey County as a leader in attracting and retaining top talent, uh, the mobility, some of the work being done in terms of telecommuting, uh, these are key initiatives that really will allow us to you know, attract and retain top talent. And this certainly can all be completed and is intended to be complete, completed in a phased approach. There's challenges, you know, just with anything. And certainly it is a huge cultural shift. Uh, that will be challenging. It is critical to this. But I think in many ways the county has demonstrated it's ready for this change and that process has begun. Much of the work uh, done to date under TARP sets the stage and positions us well to move forward with this cultural change. We do need to have engagement with the community as we start to explore these different um, areas and placements of facilities. And we will need the communities also to understand that this is about being flexible and adaptable to the changing needs that what they maybe see or have on day one um, will change and evolve as those needs do change. We definitely will need the continued support of the board, not that we don't have it or don't expect we'll have it, but it is going to be a fairly long haul to get us through this implementation and we'll just need to keep moving forward together to make it happen. And there will also be, as we uh, define the facilities, locations, sizes, etc., we certainly expect there will be a capital outlay uh, that will have to happen to move us through these, these phases. As we've laid this out for phase one, which really covers the next one to two years, much work still to be done on this. We really have to fine tune that integrated service delivery you know what truly is is in to begin with knowing that it will change over time and then based on which services are in and the public facing folks that deliver those services that will then lead us into that ultimate um, answer of so how big are these facilities and then where should they be based on the service mix and the location geographic locations that we've identified We'll take a look at existing facilities uh, as service delivery locations, if any existing facilities are opportunities for that. Uh, and if not, obviously we will be doing the site search for new locations. We'll also look at the existing, uh, particularly suburban locations, as that touchdown space for staff. We've already identified, I'll call it the Maplewood campus here, but this is really the property that uh, currently has a amalgamation of things on it, but including the Parks Admin Building, the barn, the Care Center, the Family Service Center, some of the other parks facilities. Just seeing if that campus in some fashion provides us ability for some uh, suburban touchdown space or meeting space for staff uh, that doesn't exist there today. The mobile service team is really a whole initiative of its own that will have to be undertaken by the Residents First program. Also, under the Residents First program, the information management, this whole uh, the, the point made earlier around data exchange, data sharing, and what we can or can't do, or what the public facing teams can or can't do for the benefit of the residents in providing service. And all of that is certainly not going to happen without a strong focus on change management um, for all that are affected. New technologies, new policies, strategies, and we do believe along the way in the not too distant future that we would need to create, establish a, a public 
website or page that allows people to see what we're doing, where we're going, what's our vision, what's our timeline, and that we can solicit feedback on those steps and, and where we're headed. In the phase two, which is the three to five year outlook, we would be expecting to move forward on a new site. Uh, hopefully we have the flexibility that when and where uh, that site is found and is available, we move. But at the moment, we're thinking that would probably be more in the, in the three year time frame. Finalizing the plans for all the service delivery locations, the capital plans, uh, and to support those along again with the changes to the technologies and teams uh, to deliver those services. The additional public engagement around, particularly in this three to five year, the suburban locations, looking to then be moving the external tenants out of Metro Square and backfilling with the, call it the administrative, but really it's the non-public facing staff uh, to backfill Metro Square and ultimately as well Plato to the degree that, that facility is needed for the non-public facing staff as well. Really phase three full implementation is five to ten years um, and along the way in the five to ten years I'm sure with the flexible uh, nature of what we're putting in place and the changes that will occur we will be adapting and revising as we go and looking to get continuous feedback from the community and the staff and those served as to how we're doing. So I'm going to um, start where I started. Or my comment at the beginning was this is exciting. We've been waiting a long time. Um, to this is extremely thoughtful, thorough um, work. And from my perspective, it gives me a lot of confidence that we're well on this path. And we've got a plan on how we're going to continue to move down this path. I think that's a really good spot for us to be at this point. I'll start going through my list, and then we'll just go right around so everybody can get ready and can sort where they want to go. But I'll start off real quick. I want to start off, and we don't need to go to these slides, but slide six early on in the presentation, we <coughs> identified the cultural change. And back at slide 30, you reinforced it in the challenges. You talked about you know some of the minimization of the talent attraction and the retention we've done and people have been coming to us because of the work we're doing. But we've got a lot, a lot of people in this organization. This is going to be tough for them. And I want to make sure that as we're moving forward, we are doing parallel work in supporting this cultural change and supporting our workforce to be able to be get too excited about this and be in partners with this rather than active resistors. Because that could happen and that to me is one of the biggest reasons. Um, risks we have here is active resistors, no matter where they're at throughout the organization. And I want to make sure we're supporting our employees and leadership team too, because this is going to be a lot of work on our leadership team as they're looking to help move forward on this cultural shift. And once I get to some of my other comments, you'll understand why I started there. Um, so on the, um, I really appreciated your, um, you don't need to go to this slide, but slide 16, you, you've really worked with uh, the folks in affordable housing and you had that nice overlay map. But actually in your appendix you've got the, 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 the overlay of families living in poverty, slide 38. That's much more important to me because we have so many more people living in a community in, in affordable housing that is not really quality housing. It's not, it doesn't even show up on the affordable housing list, right? That's, it's only the contracted stuff, that's only the subset especially for a number of our communities. I got way more people living in housing that would never show up on an affordable housing list. We are probably in more crisis and use our services more. So I think the, the map of folks living in poverty is more meaningful to us. Because when I first seen your affordable housing one, I was like, okay, that's really cool. But there's a difference between 30% AMI and 80% AMI, right? And if we're not drilling down and finding that, we're missing, and I think if you're living in poverty, it actually really helps demonstrate that we don't miss nobody that way, but we're really, so to me that number 38, living in poverty is much more powerful, much more useful tool moving forward. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll bring some angst to everybody here, but I think we've got to love some opportunities, right? So, you know, part of uh, slide 15, and you can go to that slide if you want, 
one of the things you talked about is accessibility. Um, accessibility, facilities, staff availability, hours, etc. I really want us, I'm going to call it out here, I really want us to take a look at. We are basically an 8 to 4.30 Monday through Friday organization. And our users are not that. In fact, some of our biggest users are doing two part-time jobs when we're offering them the ability to connect with us and when they don't have an op option. So I think we need to use this opportunity. Do we become a six-day operation for some things? Do we become a 10-day, 10 10-hour? 10 Do we switch our eight-hour accessibility from noon to 8.30? And these are big cultural shifts. But if we're going to truly be resident first, it can't just be about the facility and the location. It has to be about the access. And, and the access is about time of day or day of week. And I really think at some, maybe it's not integrated here, maybe it's a parallel process, but if we're not taking advantage of that, we're going to miss out on really making that transformative change. And it's something you can't, it's going to be really hard to come back and kind of like capture at the end or once we get through this. You have to bring it along in a parallel process because it will affect decisions that we make about places and all those types of things. And so I'm really encouraging you to take, when you talk about um, availability and hours that we're actually being really broad and what we're thinking um, throughout the day on that and then throughout the days of the week on that. And then, um, and I'm going to go to the back of house services and, and, and I, I, I'm thinking I felt this in there but I want to call this out kind of again in that cultural change with those opportunities. Many of our back of house services, because they're fragmented and siloed right now, we've got um, similar operations supporting different or parts of our organization. And as we bring those together, what efficiencies can we be driving by back house, you know, and, I, and I'll just grab something, you know, something that's going on in public health where there might be more capacity and something that's going on in corrections. And when we bring that together, rather than looking at it as public health support or correction support, is it really just supporting our, our employees to be able to do their job? And can we drive efficiencies in that and take a look at that if we're looking at the back house pieces? I think I heard that it's a part of the conversation, but I really wanted to call that out. And then I wanted to go to slide 27, um, the conversation about you know the clinical services, um, kind of, uh, what was the wording you used there? Um, maintain existing clinical and specialty services, and I understand that. My biggest concern is when I asked Ryan to give us an example, it was pretty much all 555, and that's one of our most miserable places to, for our people to go to. And so I don't want that to be kind of this, I don't know what you would call it, but a work on all the work we're doing because we're just gonna let that sit because it's clinical services, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because we have not invested in that building and at some point we're going to get here. And we've got to figure that out. And we, I don't want it to get left off because it's mostly clinical services that may, might not be a part of a core or integrated service delivery. And again, uh, it brings some co complexity to it. But we can't leave that sitting out there for three, four, or five years. And then the last comment I'll make, and certainly I'll let you guys weigh in on all the things and we'll just go yeah. around. But I want to go back to, um, again, kind of this bigger policy piece. You talked about these smaller meeting rooms, um, and then you brought up probation, where probation might not make sense to be a part of the core services or integrated services, but it might make sense for them to utilize the smaller meeting room. And I think your quote was, probation can accomplish what it needs to accomplish. And I, I want to challenge us again on this, right, that we need to be looking not in the rear view mirror about what a probation was supposed to be accomplishing. In so many ways, it was actually detrimental to what we're hoping we have. And, and looking at forward here about um, if we're separating all people that have to come in to probation, and there are times when we need to do that for their own good or for public safety, but really for the most part, we're sending a message that they're still stigmatized that we're separating them out, we're highlighting them, we're calling them out rather than integrating them into all the work we do. So when probation needs to accomplish what it needs to accomplish, I'm hoping that what it needs to accomplish is actually looking forward 
and not in the room room there. So it's redefining what that might mean. And maybe it means more than just having a small meeting room. Maybe it does mean that they're actually in that site, that that, that probation could happen with all the other things that need to happen. So those are the kind of the challenges for me for the folks as we move forward. That's it for my list. So Mr. Chair, if it's okay, what Joanne and I were quickly kind of doing here is we were suggesting if we go commissioner by commissioner, we'll keep a list and we'll maybe respond to it in bulk. Perfect. Is that okay? So we Perfect. can kind of chunk it? I'd like that. Because I want to both listen and not respond to each one, but I also want to respond to each one. What was your first one? That's the only one I missed. I, well, I Some started with the cultural time. change and how we got to support our, not only yeah. our, all our frontline right. employees on that cultural yep. change, but how we're supporting our leadership team who is going to have to manage that. So, uh, thank you. Well, I think you're... You so, to, to that, but I'll go after each, right? I'll answer yours now, so knock those off quickly. And then we'll okay. Keep, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, just real quickly, and I'll do my best to answer them on behalf of the group. It's also a good test for me to see if we've been talking about the same things as we go, and in many ways, I think we are. On the cultural change piece, 100% agree. Uh, that is why this is a big deal for the residence first work more broadly. We're gonna be back in January on a residence first workshop, checking in on how this all integrates together. And you can see why the investments you chose to invest in the organization this morning around 15.1 million across people process, technology buildings comes to life here in a real way. That, that's a big part of it. And change management is now, there's a place to go for that investment that did not exist in 2019. On the hours and policies practice, I both want to say uh, in our upcoming, you know, at the end of our labor contracts, this needs to be a part of the conversation. And I want to just put it on the record that I want to both respect that process and have that, that conversation needs to occur at the right times in the right settings, right? So um, with all of that being said, as we move towards more flexibility, we need a mobile workplace policy for Ramsey County. We have an interim policy we've worked on in some of our biggest departments that you see show up here to get us over the next 12 to 18 months, but we want to look at a countywide policy. That's an effort right now that's staff across this organization and leaders have been taking on. We've been working in partnership with labor on that as well. A mobile workplace policy sets the ground for flexibility to occur in places like this. By mobile, I do not mean only between 8 to 4.30 and only people who don't work with residents. And I absolutely agree with you. Our hours need to shift over time to think about how we meet the needs of those in our community. Um, because I also can't access anything I would want to access in the county because you seem to keep me employed pretty busily <laughs> between 8 and 4.30. <laughs> but in all seriousness, on the map noted, they're all as important. We just took a couple as examples. On the administrative services, I would agree there will be efficiencies. The one thing I would say is the efficiencies will likely need to go into speeding up and doing better in some areas as opposed to being able to reduce the number of headcount. I think one of the big things the Great Recession did is in order to keep uh, service where we could, we, we gutted some of that back office stuff wherever we could to try and save that service delivery. Our contract timing, we heard an example yesterday when I was with Commissioner McGuire of the length of time it takes right now to process payment. And like, I can't defend it. I, I just, I cannot defend it. And I'm also not trying to disparage the staff we have. I'm hoping that these efficiencies and the mobile workplace and the idea of meeting people where they're at gets us to a level where those delays are not the norm in the way in which we do our business. 555 and smile, uh, Paul would smile, noted. And I think that 555 brings a special case of if an opportunity presents itself in the nearer term than the longer term, under a vision that this board shares, we need to have that conversation sooner rather than later and not just say some other day, some other day, some other day. Probation, if I was making one critique of our own presentation today, I would say I think probation, we learn every year how it's more integral than we sometimes would have said three or four years ago. I think by the end of this process, we'll see it as more integral than we did today. Um, we're learning that at Dorothy Day or at Higher Ground where that was a feared service when that project started and now it's becoming something people want to see on site as they trust our POs and our staff. And so um, I, I want to agree that we have opportunities there. Anything you guys want to add on those questions? Could I add just one thing to the corrections piece? Um, Mr. Chair, during the accessible service and delivery uh, work we did last year, that was one of the areas that we really did focus on in talking with corrections, and we mapped for them as well their current locations, and again last year, the residents served. And their locations were actually very well matched to those they served. So that became a bit of the reason why we didn't enter into this phase thinking we're moving them. Yeah. but by talking about making the accommodation that they could meet people in the new facilities, 
is recognizing that if it makes sense, we want them to be there. But it was more of the recognition that at least right now, their locations are quite well matched. And they might, might or they may or may not be the right locations for other core services. But we would also look at that factor as well. Do they become one of the urban neighborhood locations? So again, they're not totally excluded, but there were reasons for their locations today, at least, being well situated. Well, we, I appreciate yeah. that. And I'm glad to hear that there's some thought going in there. And I'm glad to hear it's like in both ways where maybe that could become one of the hubs. Right. And I think it is important to make sure that they're probably farther ahead about making sure they're more accessible in the community to the people they're serving, which is really good. But it's more, my concern was more than just are we accessible in a physical way, but what kind of message are we sending when we're in a segmented, silo way, and pulling out certain parts of our service and keeping them away from the rest of the service, and I think that's an important message. Yes, thank you. Trista? Yeah. Thank Let's you. Right uh, well, I have a question though because it is now 10 minutes to 3 and I know that we're supposed to be here but I will tell you that my grandchildren are in production this afternoon and I'm going for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I have to leave here. I mean 4 o'clock is like the latest I could possibly leave here. Um, rather than doing, it, this is going to take a long time because we all have a lot of comments and questions. There are some things that are going to be easy to answer and just give us an answer to that. But otherwise, why don't we listen to everybody, and then we probably have a lot of the same concerns and questions. And if they're not answered, we can come back and say, yeah, what's, what about this? Yeah. Great. Uh, I just want to thank you for this work. It is really exciting. When I uh, first met with Lee Merkins, before I was even sworn in, I asked all kinds of questions about facilities, and he said, just wait, it's coming. So thanks, Lee. It's here. <laughs> um, uh, the questions I had, I want to just get right into, I know we covered a big plan, but I'm curious on financial impact. As we begin to move our tenants out of Metro Square over the next two years or so, what is the financial impact of losing that um, dollar that we're currently collecting from them? Are we prepared to fill that gap in the meantime before we start refilling it with our own staff? I mean, there's clearly going to be a capital investment plan that will come forward at some point. But I'm just wondering is, you know, as we begin phasing things, what is the financial impact and, you know, where do we start uh, plugging that from our budget? Do you want to take, yeah. what, what, go through your whole okay. list and then go. go That's it. You cover the rest. That's oh. all I have. Um, Commissioner Mattis Castillo, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Mattis Castillo members, uh, what I would note to that is, you know, Yes, there's clearly lost revenue, and there'll be this gap where you end up kind of awkwardly in a couple of buildings differently than you are today, right? But as we vacate buildings like the East Building and back office functions, eventually you get to a new equilibrium, and it's just staff are in different spaces. And so we are gonna have to, I don't have a specific number for you. We could, as a follow-up, provide you with the numbers of lease revenue currently pulled from Metro. I think that'd be a good thing for us to share. And I'll be honest too, not all our tenants are happy. They like Metro, they like the service that Jean and her outfit provide on behalf of Ramsey County to them. But when we think about the need to unify our staff and the change management component, we need to create space that feels throughout that building like we are building one county together across departments. Tony. Well, thank you. I don't know how you kept this all quiet on our time. But this was really a lot. And it is exciting. Thank you very, very much to the team that has been working, uh, both the team of our staff and consulting, as well as the engaged folk in our staff throughout the county and, and community that you've gotten information from. Um, I look at this workshop, and it's entitled Residents First Facilities, and I know why because we're talking about a facility plan and how that accomplishes our vision of services that are integrated and distributed as appropriate to meet the needs of our community. I want to um, recognize that you all stated that this is really about services and placing services where they need to be. It's also about engagement and making certain that our facilities, as they are co as they're distributed and co-located, and even mobile out into the community are engaging 
those that we serve. So I really appreciate seeing spaces that are community spaces within the definition of configurations we'd be looking forward to in the future because this really is about residents for services and I believe that you're also showing us the greater potential for engagement and engaging particularly those people who are most in, impacted by these services in new creative and innovative ways within our facilities and within neighborhoods and also outwardly within facilities where we would be mobile uh, and able to be engaged. I like the concept of the mobile teams. We'll come back to that. You know, it allows us to be in community spaces. It allows us to meet needs that may be more flexible and that may change over time. Uh, and it allows us, I think, to not just be in community spaces, but to impact and affect partnerships that will help us to do the work. Um, there are a couple of things, there are a lot of things that have been said already. There are a couple of things I'd like to point out. Um, as I look at page 17, I believe it was, where we talked about the input that we're getting, and in particular the input that we're getting from residents and staff, we spoke about data privacy in that slide, I believe, and I'm particularly um, interested in whether the data privacy was mentioned by staff, by community, by both, and you know that we're looking at the opportunity as we reconfigure these services and locations to do that kind of intake that would allow us to get information from people and to share that information. We always run into data sharing issues, uh, but taking advantage of the opportunity to flip that on the other side to get permission and to find ways to use technology to allow that permission to aid us in sharing what our residents want to have shared so that we can do a better job for those residents. So again, I can I conflate this to services and uh, engagement and not just about facilities, so forgive me for doing that. Another question on that is, this is about locating services, but we can't ignore the technology pieces you've mentioned or even what I don't consider technology today, the telephone piece. And so as we think about the co-locating, the sharing, the partnering of services, I want us to think about how we get better not just face-to-face, -face, but how we get better even because of our configuration, our ability, our training, our co-locating, et cetera, in any connection with a resident. So I just needed to say that. I wanted to also state that children, Space for children is so important, so thank you for recognizing that and for putting that there. But children don't wait. They play. <laughs> <laughs> they play, they engage, they read, you know, they do active things. And so I am hoping that as we think about new configurations for our spaces, we're thinking about children in different ways too. So that as parents come with their children, their children are able to engage, to be active, and not just to be tolerated, but to be supported and enriched in our environment. I realize that may require some additional partnering or resources that we may not have, but we need to keep that at top of mind as we move this forward. So thank you for the identification of children's spaces and let's think about that as real children's places. Uh, the last thing that I'll take the opportunity to say now, no, there are two more things, I'm glad that although workforce was not listed as one of the departments engaged early on, that I did see workforce come up in the services you know, a number of times. I'm encouraged that workforce is strongly considered as one of those core services and that we will be working to engage and to integrate the work that is done so that workforce is one of, one of those that are co-located and working collaboratively together. Uh, the last thing. As we look at the mobile teams, they are an opportunity not just to move into the future, but to move some of this work forward. You know, they are certainly an opportunity for us to investigate and to take advantage of opportunities that may exist earlier than as we move into that second phase. Uh, it is an opportunity, I believe, to take advantage 
of uh, possibilities that may come our way in phase one to move some of that mobile teaming uh, out into the community up, I believe would be a good idea. You know, so let's not be static in terms of looking at that in phase two, three to five years out. You know, this is, this is great, but it's taken us five years to get here. Um, so let's make sure that we are able to think about that earlier. Um, and, and as we think about the mobile teams, again, I think I said before, that's an opportunity for partnerships, for developing relationships. It's not just for co-locating. So we have to think about how we partner. These are co-investments that we are making with potentially other jurisdictions, community organizations, with uh, even the people that we serve. So how do we partner for the long term, realizing that mobile teams are supposed to be flexible, but we should be thinking about relationships over the long term. So thank you very, very much. This is exciting. Right. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Carter, on engaging residents in community spaces, thanks for those comments. Um, nothing that I can add to the way you put it. On the data privacy and data sharing, I'm going to guess it's more of a staff concern than it is from residents. Uh, this continues to vex us in some challenging ways, and yet in the theory of getting to yes, like we have to figure it out, we've been bogged down. There's, there are different reciprocity, like there are different agreements that can happen one way with some departments than they can happen the back way in reverse, workforce being an, a challenge with the rest of the health and wellness team, for example. And what I can tell you now is we've done a decent job of identifying the barriers over the last year and a half, yeah. um, but we can't stop, we don't win a, the game show for identifying the barrier, right? So we have to go to the next phase and that'll be part of the challenge. And I'll put that on my plate of it kind of, as this year got ratcheted up, this is not something we've brought to the finish line and we're kind of, we've been stuck on that. So more to come. Um, appreciate that comment on location tech policy, space for children. We were planning on having them wait silently in line, but <laughs> <laughs> with, a three to, your kids with a three to five year old at home, I couldn't help but do that. Um, well, well said the entire way, and I think that's an important spot to bring back on its own because this is developing a model that just simply, we've, we've kind of worked in tough constraints currently around children's spaces. I'm looking at some of the folks I've worked with on it, and, um, and Tina's been working on it for a long time, and I know uh, Ling's working on it as well. We need to do better in that spot. Uh, workforce has been very engaged. The North St. Paul piece is specific to workforce as well. I think you all know the location, but I want to be clear on that here. And the mobile team, well said. Part of this is things are going to pop at the at the rate they pop at. We need to be ready and prepared where they happen. And um, I'll end on that comment a little bit. But if there's an opportunity to move faster, we shouldn't wait for an artificial reason for four more years because there's opportunity there for sure. Okay, okay Tony. I know there's more to come. Thank you, oh, Mr. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Awesome. Chair. And I'm happy to go last if Victoria needs to get going or no. if people want to go first. I don't, I don't need to be next. Okay. You, I don't have that long of a list and try you to save my voice either. anyway. <laughs> I can't believe it's lasted this long. Right? Um, great work. I mean, we've all been waiting for this. This is just like so exciting. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of that. Um, I... Um, I'm wondering if we have, if, as you're talking about co-locating, or no, as you're talking about partnerships, I meant stakeholders, if we're thinking about co-locating, and if you've already talked about that, I just wonder if there's any people that you are co-locating more with than others. Um, I support the more hours, and um, for all of our things, I especially want our libraries have more hours too, so I know that's, you know, it's a, it's a amenity that's, uh, going to be maybe one of our service delivery systems, and I, and I love the fact that our libraries might have more hours. Um, I know my voice is going as I'm talking. Tony, you might have to read our um, parks. <laughs> I'm just curious where parks facilities, and maybe they fit in there just in CM, because we have parks facilities. And I will, I will just let you guys talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. This is this is I'm like so excited. Really I, hard. Really, you know, I really want to get this out. Um, We've been, yeah, we've been talking so much about one county, one door, mm -hmm. and so I haven't heard it really <coughs> talked about here, but I know when we're in different places, which I love that we're going to be mobile locations. I mean, maybe we just talk about where our one county, one door. Yeah. So when yeah. we go someplace, it is the door that they need to be at, not the door down the street. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good job. Breathe. Not talk the rest of the day. Nicole. Um, so I want to um, 
piggyback on something Commissioner Carter said about the data privacy and if barriers have been identified, um, see that Jennifer came back in, but can we be tracking some of this? If, if some of this is a the statute change that needs to happen, I think that is um, something that I heard about at Department of Human Services for I love that they're interested in breaking down those barriers. So this is an opportunity for partnership at the state level and the sooner we can break down the legal barriers to data sharing, the sooner we can come up with technological solutions to, to effectively share the data and, and remove those barriers for families. So looking potentially at a addition to legislative platforms or 2021. I think we, if we have that list, that's good. Um, modern technology, again, I want to echo what, what Commissioner Carter said, it's so critical to, to be able to effectively implement these programs, and so it's something I've already talked to Jennifer over about as well, that um, if we don't have, it, it's great to call like low paid services and have everything there, but if the systems don't talk to one another, you're still going to have to re-enter everything multiple times, so that's like a dual track that we should be pursuing to really make this effective. Can I just um, clarify, and you mean state, you're talking now about yes, state, state Texas. System. I just want to be yeah. clear for everybody here. Yes, yes. thank you, yes, thank you. state technology systems. Um, and I just want to, um, in shifting hours, make sure we acknowledge that um, one of the challenges to that is finding child care and what role can the county play in making sure that families that are going to be working these shifting hours are able to find care for their kids outside of the 8 to 5 schedule because that becomes a huge barrier to recruiting uh, and retaining staff. Um, and it's something that already came up in the in the budget document for 911 operators and the challenges of recruiting them. Um, and then when it comes to third party partners, also making sure we're taking advantage of opportunities, um, like their school district just passed a big um, levy to, to build some new facilities and is there opportunities to co-locate with them, especially because some of their facilities are going to be along bus rapid transit lines. So that as an opportunity in the suburbs, I know it wasn't highlighted on the chart, but um, when it comes to taking those opportunities when they come is that one. Um, and then again, um, with what Commissioner Carter said about the mobile teams and you know not wanting to wait, the nice thing about piloting some mobile teams first is it could give us an opportunity to test some locations before we settle down and invest in capital there um, to see if people are showing up and, if, uh, and responsive. It also gives you an opportunity to test uh, the services that are located together to see if they're working the way you think that they'll work. So I, I would encourage piloting some of those mobile teams sooner rather than later. Commissioner McDonough uh, and previous two commissioners, I'll on the wall here at once. Uh, I'll end on the co-locating question about parks. Parks would not be defined as a core service here because they don't overlap in the other areas. They remain very important, obviously. This is that important services don't fully fit on the back end administrative side, part of the conversation, and Maplewood Campus, as we mentioned, could be a part of it. Uh, I'll end that, I'll bring libraries into the co-locating conversation in a second. On the one county, one door, um, I think what this project shows and where we're now at is we will never have one county with literally one door. <laughs> However, the idea of when you walk through a door, you can access more of and a large portion of the county is really what one county, one door I think now means. And you're right that we've never, we didn't talk about it right here, but that's what I would say is you open the door to the service center in St. Paul, which would be the 100% of services or at one of those three suburban sites where it might be 50, 60, 70% of services that one door is accessed in a way that right now might be 20 or 30 percent and I think that's the vision there. Um, uh, to Commissioner Fredham's point about data privacy, well said, we will make the integration with the legislative piece and see if there's anything before the January, I think you have a January legislative committee, I'll, we'll check into that. Uh, modern tech of state systems, I know you're throwing a 30th birthday for the Maxis system this year, you've told me before. Uh, we actually don't, we want to celebrate his birthday and funeral on the same day would be our approach. Um, finding child care is a huge issue as we already talked about, so I'll end on the third party partners co-locating in libraries. I'll be a little more direct than even what the recommendation is here because there's a zone here and, and that's intentional on behalf of Gene saying we need to be flexible and open to where the final answers are best made here and um, I fully condone that and agree with that. I would also say right now those best locations we have trusted institutions in our community libraries. We know that you as a board have made major investments in them over many years. When we did the pilot around um, the uh, Obamacare Affordable Care Act registration, it demonstrated on a level that I had not seen before the power of using libraries. People wanted to go there. They felt safer going there than they felt going to the East Building in many cases, right? And we need to be up in arms about that or realize we have something special through those library opportunities. 
We're working on some ways to test some things in the near term to see if that plays true on some other ways. More to come on that. Really exciting. Um, but I think in terms of libraries and the future, we both need to have excellent libraries and also think about how they could become excellent much more if we invest in them appropriately. And that could lead to conversations around hours in a different way as well. I'm not fully there right now. And on the third party partners, the final piece, maybe for buildings, but also um, we're learning through the, the Catholic Charities Higher Ground Project. We have space where our contracted providers could become a part of our space. And we, we were talking about this in our walkthrough not that long ago. We may evaluate in the future contracts where we ask providers to be on site in our space as a part of recognizing that Ramsey County extends beyond our 4,100 employees to those we contract with. So very much on the radar, not quite at that spot yet, but Joanne even mentioned residents brought some of those co-locating opportunities up while we were in the conversations today. Tony, I know you had a question, but I'd like to get to Victoria, oh. and then we can all just kind of yeah. end with the final panel. Questions or comments? Victoria? Well, first of all, I maybe should have taken Mary Jo up on her offer because I can't really read everything I wrote here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I would have remembered it better. Um, when on, pay, on slide 11, Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, when you talked about who do you serve um, and what are your services, noting that um, who we serve may um, need multiple services. So the who and the what. How did you, you know, somebody needs chemical health, somebody need, and they need mental health services, and they need um, children in need of protection or whatever. I mean, all these different services, but it's one who. You see what I'm saying? We'll come back to it. Okay. And then um, I, on slide 26, and I don't think you have to go to that one, the integrated versus co-location. Um, can you talk a little, tease that out just a little bit for me, because um, primarily, we're, and you're right, I mean, I think we start in steps. But how does it go from co-location to integrated so that when that <coughs> one family comes in that needs all those different services, they don't have to go to somebody else. Either the people come to them because I don't think we're going to train staff that's going to do everything for everybody, but the staff would come to them versus them going to the staff. Is that the difference? Or Tell me what you're thinking there. Okay. No, yeah, I've got more. Okay. Um, and then... Um, I, you know, it didn't surprise me about the parking um, because, <laughs> because I mean, honestly, you know, when we built the um, uh, the court in Maplewood on land that was donated by the city of Maplewood and gave up part of their parking lot um, for uh, being able to be there, um, it was surprising to find out how many people, and I don't remember what the percentage is now, and I didn't think about it before I came in here. But there's a large percentage of people that go there that live in St. Paul because they've got parking, <coughs> they've got, it's accessible, it's not as busy for obvious reasons. It doesn't have the same volume coming through there. But it really does make a difference if there's, if you feel like, if I have to go to Plato Building, even myself, I'm so much happier going there than I am <laughs> going to 555 Park, or Cedar. Um, and so it's, um, that really does make a difference. And I hadn't thought about it as being a big deal until I saw this. And so I think that that is something that we need to think about. And, um, you know, paying for parking also. Um, if free parking is the best because, especially if somebody's on <laughs> um, <laughs> oh no, the dance party started at 3 30. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody is there for services, uh, for you know, uh, financial services, and they have to pay to park, um, and you don't know how long you're going to be in there and all of that, that makes a difference as well. I like the idea, and I just wanted to comment on, um, and I assume when you're talking the Maplewood campus, part of that is just the Maplewood Mall area and what they're trying to do, or maybe not. Okay. Well, then you should be thinking about this because there's a group in Maplewood that is looking at reimagining what that will look like because it's real clear that the only mall that's expanding in this area is Rosedale. And so they are looking at what's going to happen there. The old hotel 
that they had in the back there is now uh, senior living. And so um, I think, you know, engaging Maplewood on, you know, what could that be? I mean, transit is there, everything is there. Um, all the healthcare facilities are so close by and all that stuff. So um, that was one. And then also, you talked about, uh, Commissioner Fretham brought up the Wiper Lake schools and their referendum. Well, one of the things that they did in the past was they had a model that was basically what we're talking about. That it had everything within the school. And it, it, so it was a few years ago, probably three years ago, you could um, dig that up and see what it looked like. But that's what it was all about. It was like treating the family as a whole family and coming into the schools instead of making people grab their kids from school and try to get down to the um, uh, Plato building or, or East building. Um, and so I think that we really need to explore what those other um, collaborations could be here, um, integrated services rather than co-located services. Um, but really taking advantage of what they're trying to do too because our goals are the same. <coughs> is healthy families, healthy and safe families. Um, and then finally, oh, actually it's not finally. <laughs> Almost though. Um, the, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting too, when, when Jim, when you were talking about um, affordable housing and some of the properties that are out there that don't even, that are under the radar um, and are pretty much uninhabitable, but people are inhab inhabiting them. Um, I was at uh, a restaurant last night that's in a small strip mall on uh, Lower Afton Road and McKnight. Yeah. And there was a sewage problem. Of, and the, the, all these restaurants there were shut down for six months because the landlord wouldn't come in and take care of it. <coughs> and, and I talked to the owner and they said, man and woman and a couple, and they said, <laughs> and the worst part was they put the big thing up on the website saying that the Department of Health had closed them down. It was no fault of their own. And they didn't have, I mean, they're, they're really struggling to come back. But that's the type of thing that is a hurdle that we don't necessarily think of. Because when it comes to these houses, maybe even if the inspectors do know or have some issues with them, they don't necessarily um, go to oftentimes a landlord because if you own it, you probably are gonna try to figure out a way to fix it. But the landlords are the ones that are, are not responding in the way they should, and, and I don't know if that's legislation or what it is. But that was a real stark example to me. I mean, most places aren't uh, gonna be, well, I guess a restaurant, you, you would know that. But, but the housing, you really don't, unless it's brought to your, your attention, and the people that are living there, that's all they can afford. And so they're not going to say, hey, this is really a hole there, but it is. Um, and so that gets to the naturally occurring affordable housing. And how do you bring up some of this natural, if, if it is fixable, how do we do that? And we've got programs to try to deal with that because, again, housing, um, tra transportation, uh, a job, and that ties into my final thing, and that is um, regarding economic development. Um, and the jobs, and I know that's not a forward-facing service, but if we think about it from a workforce solution side of it, which is forward-facing, or public-facing, um, that's part of economic development as well, and I'm trying to keep that up. I do have one more thing. <laughs> I just realized it. Um, because when we're talking about the, I just want to bring this up now, and it's you know part of probation and all of those things as well, so it's in the corrections area. But I actually, it's surprising the number of people that look at our correction system as simply punishment and not rehabilitation. And I, I mean, I, we talk about it out in the community and um, it, it's just amazing to me how people, well, why would you want to do that? But you're just, they have way too nice of conditions. You should make them suffer. Well, that's going to make them come out better people. You know, and so I think that, that the probation and the services we're providing and what came out of the <coughs> county court um, discussion today on, um, I forgot what it's called, but the commitment process and stuff. But anyhow, so that's a whole lot of things that I did pretty well in translating here, but, and I don't expect the answers on all of them. I just think that they're all important parts of the puzzle. And, um, and I do think that more services 
that are on uh, transit lines um, that have capability, and most of that probably is going to be in the inner suburbs. Um, well, we almost have only inner suburbs here, but <laughs> but as far as parking and being able to get there and uh, not having to pay for parking, I mean, uh, that's all going to be critical, and I think that it's a really important move that we're making that it's, uh, you know, it's a whole count. And people will go to what is most convenient for them, um, and parking and uh, being able to have free parking is one of those issues. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Commissioner Reinhardt, commissioners, um, I'll go backwards order. I'll give Jennifer the last one. Who and what? Uh, on the corrections, the short anecdote I would use is one of the most uh, striking meetings I ever had when I when I was first doing rounds to different departments as the deputy over health and wellness. When I went to corrections, I had never had a more holistic conversation about integrated service delivery than I did that day, and it broke my long-standing incorrect assumption about people that work in corrections and their view about working with families and individuals. And in many ways, I thought they were ahead of everybody else I spent time with, which is not a disservice to them, saying, if we don't work with people better, they simply, we're just, we're just giving them a ticket right back. Like, what are we, what are we doing? Um, and so, wholeheartedly agree. Economic development noted, White Bear Lakes will pull out Senator Rieger's previous proposal and give that a look. Uh, Maplewood area, we'll look at the mall. I saw Gene writing it down. Maplewood Library is clearly a part of this conversation. It's already got proximity, so that makes perfect sense. Um, integrated versus co-located. I think the point Gene is trying to make, I hope I'm not putting incorrect words in your mouth, we've talked a lot about this is, Right now we sit next to each other. We don't actually, we haven't gotten to the phase of the unified team <coughs> mentioned for the in, um, information and public records, right? And 250 people, let's multiply the size of that by 10 and think about service delivery. And that's why we haven't gotten there yet. But as we move into 2020, outside of even this conversation, that is <coughs> where we are moving in 2020 is a conversation on how do we think about more unified uh, points of interaction and, and warm handoffs and engagement with people that feels like oh, I didn't get sent to four different counters. And we can do better, and there's spaces to move. And right now, we still sit a little bit at, thank you, I did what I can for you here. We don't make you walk now four buildings over, but we still make you walk across the room somewhere else and re-ask your question. And that's kind of, I think, the integration co-location. Okay. On the parking, uh, I can't pass. I haven't done it yet. I've held off the whole way. I both want to acknowledge it and also say this board has poised um, this community to invest multiple billions of dollars in transit in the coming years. And this is a long range and bo both a here and now and a long range investment. If we're serious about things like carbon emissions, efficient growth, accessibility, we're both going to have to try and think about how we balance a current need around parking that is completely accurate. I don't question anyone who said it with the idea that we should question why it's hard for a mom or a dad with his or her two kids to get to our current facilities. And that's gonna be a part of this, and that's not to diminish the fact that parking will be with us in the near term, in many ways it is every day. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer on the who and what. Jennifer. All right, so I, I sort of have a loaded, I have a loaded answer. So I'll try to be as short as I can. I'm gonna go back to this quick, and then I'm gonna okay. go to the one you talked Could I, before you start that then, I just wanna say, um, notice that when I talked about parking, I also talked about being in a transit route. Yeah, correct. So. Noted. So when we started this process, we deliberately started with the what, and to try to get a comprehensive list of services first, mm -hmm. so that we could get the list that we were actually talking about from, basically, so we're all singing from the same sheet of music, right? It's, these are the services, they went back, the, the groups went back, they vetted them as to these are the public facing, right? So we ended up with a group of services. The next question of who, this goes into the data privacy, goes into the integrated service, et cetera. The next part of who is, okay, of the services that you identified, right? So in our first step of those services, when you think about your services, who are you serving the most? What are the characteristics the most and the most in need which is where we ended up with sort of this top 10, if you will, that repeatedly came up to, based on the services that were identified as either the most or most in need. So what we can't or didn't get at in this particular process is an individual who might get six services because we've got that data practice sharing piece of it of the departments can't actually talk to each other and say, oh, I have that person, do you, you know what I mean? because there's privacy issues. Right. 
So what instead we had to do was look at overlapping characteristics. And we can certainly make assumptions that a high percentage of those folks that fit into this are the same person, or we have a lot of the same people that are accessing multiple services. The next step in hopefully all of this is that from a data privacy perspective, a data sharing perspective, that you are able to get to a place where there's one computer input, you actually can see oh, this person is accessing three or four services, so absolutely it would make sense for all of them to be in a co-located, integrated environment. Um, but we, we couldn't get there today because of some of those constraints. So instead we had to look at patterns, observable uh, like characteristics and traits that we could get from di different data sources to try to get at that answer. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You were loaded. <laughs> Tony. So I don't want to take a lot of time, but as we look oh, at the slide that was up there about who, what, where, uh, the one question that's missing is why. And so, you know, as is particularly as we think about integration, integrated services, the answer to that question can sometimes be because, I mean, the one who does this, but when we think about integrating, you know, we can come up with some other ways of doing things and particularly if we don't limit it to just us. You know, we know that it takes all of our partners, so as we've talked about schools here at the table and the work that they're doing, libraries, and knowing that a lot of times those libraries are our own, but also recognizing that there are libraries within other systems, you know, just like schools are different jurisdictions, we need to be considerate of those other systems with whom we might co-locate and partner, an example of which is our workforce services looking at that partnering with St. Paul Library. So I just wanted to make sure that we're not just thinking about our facilities, but that we are, and you know, I've heard it around the table, thinking about our partner facilities as well, and that we're asking that question. You know, why are we doing this work, and can it be done differently, in particular as we partner with others? Anybody else? All right. Um, Could I yeah, add one thing? Absolutely. Uh, just because it's come up quite a bit, I just want to make sure to make the comment that data privacy was not just a comment that we heard from staff. We actually heard it from some of the third-party partners as well. And I think it's a, it's important to keep that in mind because if you're going into <coughs> partnership opportunities, being able to share information with the third-party partner is also a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, and we did hear that through this process. So I just wanted to add. And sometimes it's not about the sharing, but it's about the right. accessing things. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So, absolutely. I think the work here has been very thoughtful, thorough. Um, Trista, at the beginning, said we're excited. We've been waiting long. I'm sure <laughs> you guys were full of angst because there's a lot here and you didn't know how it would be received. And I, think, I hope you have gotten a strong message from this board that it's been received well. That you know the comments and input from the board hopefully strengthen and, and energize the work. I appreciate all the staff that have shown up here today to listen to this conversation and be a part of it. Who's put the work in? And then I think um, I wanted to just share. We've got a unique opportunity at the Opportunity Center, where we currently have. We made a commitment early on to co-locate down there, and then bring different folks down there. Ryan and I actually got a chance to go down there a couple weeks ago and talk with our staff, see how it's going. And you know, one of the things they're learning, you, you, human behavior is one of the toughest things to predict, right? And they're really learning as they're, what, what do we need down there and how do we do it? So we've got this real-time opportunity down at the Opportunity Center to strengthen this work. And one of the things Ryan and I talked about next year um, was our hope that we actually would bring the whole board down there for our workshop so that you actually get to see what's going on. But we wanted to let them develop a little bit more about what they actually have down there. But it's actually pretty neat, and I think it would be a really good primer about what you are talking about and what it actually looks like in play, in practice, real time in our community. So with that, again, thanks to everybody. Um, oh, Commissioner Ortega, his apologies. He really kept his calendar open, but he had an emergency meeting that he absolutely had to be to. He apologized. He really has, he's feeling good about where we're at, and he'll reach out to you and join in and the team here to give him specific feedback from him, but he really apologizes. He kept it open to four, but it, that only lasted until about 1.30. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. We did a great job today, Thank folks. You. We did a really time. great job. We've done a lot of work. Thank you.